The last set of what I want to talk about is this idea of collective activity or meaningful collective activity. What do we do with others that matter to us? And what do we do that matters to us? Okay. So I, uh, we do a lot of research with Special Olympics because it's an example of a collective activity that a unique group of individuals participates in with other people, with peers that matter to them. Okay. But there's other recreational activities that could equally do the exact same thing, whether it's scouts that we saw, or comedy that we saw, or volunteering in a meaningful way that matters to you. Right? These are all different aspects, and having an opportunity to do so is critical. Um, I'm going to skip over this kind of stuff to show you this is the best part. You know, part of that photo elicitation, collective activity really did emerge as one of the themes for uh, parents who were taking pictures, right? I love that my son is part of a team, a community, or the coaches that would take pictures like this that showed, uh, really shows how much of a team they are. They all support each other. They come together. They're very enthusiastic. It's part of, an important part of practice, you know, like this idea of, of we are a unit, right, that matters in this way. You know, uh, even it's not just somebody came off uh, during the break and asked me, are you going to talk about people with ASD who don't, who have an intellectual disability? People, you know, is it because you're showing lots of examples of people with intellectual disability who don't have, uh, people with ASD who don't have an intellectual disability. And this is one of those contexts where it's a good fit for some but not all. You know, this one mother writes about that she has a child with autism that's been participating for years in individual events. He does not communicate well, so it's very hard to tell what he thinks about sports he plays. To the, together we got a glimpse inside mind when Michael decided to decorate, right? And this is what he kind of did on his wall, right? So there's this way that this mother is getting this picture without words of trying to understand that there's, some, there's pride here. There's something very positive here for this individual. And this is what we need to capture and imbue and facilitate uh, for people with ASD if we're going to program for thriving. Um, most recently, you know, Sisters with Autism heading to Special Olympics Winter Games, right? Um, or... Uh, a young man with autism from India. This was in the India Times, okay? Times of India, sorry. The Times of India, right? Where he achieved notoriety for um, uh, gold and special... Like, so he's being featured, they're being prized, but it's not necessarily... I hope... Yeah, so I think you get that. Positive opportunities um, is something else. So I mentioned this before. There's a difference between collective activity and positive opportunities. You know, collective activity is that meaningful participation with a group of individuals that matter. And positive opportunities are just that. It's creating opportunities that can be chosen, can, that can be taken up if one so chooses. You know, I mentioned before, you know, creating an opportunity and then asking everybody to do it, you know, does not foster self-determination. The point is that there has to be some experience of choice um, and agency in, in, making, in, in deciding to do that. So we need to foster these kind of opportunities that people can take up when, they, um, when, they so, when, when it's important to them. Vocational opportunities are certainly one of the most uh, talked about and researched areas recently in the ASD field. Okay, what are we going to do? How can we create vocational post-secondary opportunities for, uh, for people with ASD? Um, so a lot of this work has been coming out from the work of Loons Taylor and, and Seltzer and others from the US, some, uh, also David Nicholas and, and others um, here in Canada, uh, looking at this kind of employment issue in ASD. They published a study where they created this vocational index. And we can debate whether things are in the right order, but the purpose of, of trying to measure Cont uh, vocational context for ASD is important if we're going to program effectively for quality vocational placements. Right? And what they did is they kind of measured things from no vocational educational activities, they have sheltered vocational settings, say at a three, total 10 hours a week, a five with sheltered vocational settings and supported community employment, greater than 10 hours a week, and an eight would be post-secondary degree-seeking education programs or employment in the community without supports, and a nine would be employment in community without supports greater than 10 hours a week. So their attempt at at putting on some sort of index, this uh, continuum of vocational experiences is important. And where people line up is going to matter. Okay? So this is really about finding the right fit in the individual. In another study, capitalizing on um, uh, population-based kind of survey data, the NLTS2 data, which has 830 secondary students with ASD, they looked at what are the differences between uh, youth with ASD who are um, 
uh, employed and those who aren't employed. It's a very gross kind of logistic regression. So it's not a quality like on that dimension that I just talked about. Um, and what were some of the predictors of employment? Household income. Uh, so having greater household income. So those with the least kind of household income were significantly less likely than other groups. Um, Parent education was a significant predictor, so those who were coming from family situations where families had greater education. Um, having high social skills, so ratings of high social skills in the youth with ASD mattered in terms of predicting employment. So we're talking about a fit here, again. Um, not having an intellectual disability increased the likelihood of employment. Graduating high school was the strongest predictor of employment. Right, in terms of the, the, uh, improving the chances of being employed if you have autism. So assisting people to be successful in school and receiving uh, career counseling in high school. Um, uh, but in, in fact, in fact, I might be mistaken, but in fact, I believe that receiving, oh, and the other one that, yes, receiving career counseling in high school actually was inversely related. That, uh, that receiving career counseling actually reduced the likelihood of employment <laughs> afterwards. Right? And so how does it work? The, the authors, yeah, that's why I kind of I stopped there. I was like, right, I forgot to say that. I forgot to put that. So how does that work? And the authors suggested that um, those individuals who required the most, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's not uh, receiving career counseling. It's uh, uh, having um, career counselors who went into placement settings with the individual were less likely to be employed afterwards. And they suggested it's because those were the students who had the highest level of needs. So they needed to intervene, so it's actually a correlation. It's not that going into those settings caused less employment. It's that the students who needed the most help, right? When those people went into the community, when the career counselors went into the communities, it helped. But the fact is, after high school, there's no more career counselor. That person's now in that employment setting, but without that level of support. So it's not, they're not employed anymore. So very important studies that are contributing to our understanding of facilitating important aspects of opportunity down the line. But this really is about the right match. The extent to which a particular job meets the individual's needs in terms of challenge, interest, comfort, camaraderie, status, hours, pay, and benefits. This is not just about are you employed or aren't you. Right? You can take the word job out here and put another thing in, and maybe except for pay and benefits, um, uh, it still matters, right? This is about what is the right positive environment for an individual. I think that everybody um, deserves to have these kind of experiences in the end. If I'm going to sum it up, skills to manage stress are critical, right? Skills to enable access in the community good physical health and physical activity, a developmentally appropriate sense of control over one's life. Um, so it changes, you know, my four-year-old has a different sense of control than say when he's 21, I expect, right? It's developmental. Um, a reciprocal but non-stressful relationships are important for everybody. Uh, caregivers who are nurtured and supported to promote mental health in themselves and others. A safe place to live and learn an environment with limited stress and limited stress. I always try to underscore this. It's not an environment with no stress that's important. Right? We all deserve to experience some stress in our life. It's an important part of growth. Right? It really is a critical aspect of growth. But it's the, it's the right timely stress and limited amount in the right way that we can then learn to manage and develop confidence with. And, um, and lastly, meaningful activities in our community. And by community, I mean our contexts. Right? So you know, studying these positive constructs, I spent most of the time, we started off really talking about negative and we talked about these problems and then I moved to the, the positive on purpose to maybe some of you actually experienced the lightness of being when I started to talk about the positive aspects and the thriving and I tried to do that on purpose. If that happened, it was on purpose. If you didn't like that, it was totally not meant to be. But the <laughs> point is that, that you know, that focusing and finding that balance, if we can measure positive and we can think about programming for positive, the interventions look different than if we're trying to treat the, the, the symptoms, the problems. Interventions have to be community interventions. They have to tap a wider array, right, of, of systemic and kind of holistic um, uh, uh, treatment kind of um, targets. Okay, so change means helping the individual, but it also means helping the environment, right? We can't put the responsibility on a person or on a specific parent or on a specific clinician to, to make all of this happen, all 
all right? We have to improve the individual and we have to improve their contexts, okay? So interventions need interventions, right? And lastly, you know, identifying predictors of wellness, I think, in the end, um, from a research perspective, will lead to more preventative interventions because this is not about symptom reduction, right? This is about promotion. This is about addressing kind of a person in a way that we do so that they remain healthy and that, they, that they're happy, right, going forward. And this is something that's a quality assurance issue, right? It's, it, like like uh, Tony said, it's a quality of life issue. So I uh, just want to kind of underscore the funders of, of kind of my research on the chair. Again, now, now the psychologists don't take my license away, but the funders do, if I don't mention it. So uh, the, the chair that I hold is funded by Health Canada but also, um, and CIHR, but also with a number of important stakeholders like CASDA, Autism Speaks Canada, um, uh, NeuroDevNet, and the Cindy Family Foundation. Um, and for those of you who are interested in this topic and other things, we have an ASD mental health blog uh, that you can follow. We post kind of research summaries and stuff on, um, as well as you can follow me on, on Twitter um, if, if, if you tweet. Um, and, uh, and there's our kind of ASD, our, our lab kind of Twitter account as well. Okay. So, so thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your kind of time this morning.